Well guys, we're here. The last world in Plant vs Zombies 2. 10 worlds down and one more to go. I'll save most of my yapping for the end of this video, but I gotta say thank you so much for sticking around and getting me to 90,000 subscribers. We're just 10k away from the coveted silver play button, so subscribe to make a little goblin's dream come true. Without further ado, let's finish this long and hard adventure and reach our climax together. Day 1 it's good to be back in the modern day. Our final world gimmick is Time Rifts. Portals that open up and shout out zombies from a set world. They're really cool little nods to many of the different chapters in our journey. This world does make the almost baffling decision to not use these in every level. In fact, they don't even appear in most of the levels. But I don't think it's an issue since this world uses a mix of zombies from all the worlds anyway. I can feel the difficulty already. I don't know if this level was even possible with peanuts only. Day 2 and we already have a really weird interaction caused by the mix of zombies here. When a torch zombie kills an exploder nut, it doesn't explode. I can't think of any other instant kill zombie that nullifies the exploder nut like this. You can polymorph it with the octopus or wizard zombie, and you can drown them with the fisherman, but this is the only true form of killing a plant that doesn't set off the exploder nut. I'm not sure if it's a bug or if it's actually intended, but it is kind of neat I guess. Another interesting thing about the modern day is this is the earliest I've struggled to beat a level. Why is day 2 of this world so damn hard? The mix of big wave beach zombies being overwhelmingly broken and the twisted villain in the torch zombie left me struggling at day 2 for a good 20 minutes, which isn't the hardest level I've done by far, but for day 2 that got me sweating. Day 3 is a conveyor belt level and the arrival of another premium plant that I don't care about, as it's immediately overshadowed by the return of the iconic newspaper zombie. This fella must have been reading some serious self help bullshit because the newspaper zombie's fucking jacked now. When you break his newspaper, he sprints at record speed with the immaculate form of that one kid who would run to lunch every day at school. Not only is he fast as fuck though, he rips plants apart like they're nothing. Between games, the newspaper zombie must have been doing some gorilla grade gear. Day 4 starts the new trend of beginning levels with a variety of imps. It's a cute little throwback. The little dragon imps, which I asked to see more often in the Dark Age, is actually immune to fire damage, which for some reason includes the exploder nut. I feel like the exploder nut does more of like a force slash impact damage, but it's not a very big deal because peanuts can clear them very easily. The appeal of modern day to me at least is seeing how zombies from different worlds interact with each other. But did we really need a level based around the spinning dipshit zombie because that's what day 5 is. It's easily my least favourite zombie and the most minor inconvenience. There isn't really much more to say, I just despise the beyblading loser. Day 6 is basically a custom nut level. It's a sun production level where we're giving sun tiles to use, but they're at the very front of the lawn. A tremendous downside if you're soft, but nuts are hard, so this one was really easy. I think it's pretty funny that this world utilises the Lost City's world gimmick better than the Lost City literally ever did. In this one, I placed a single peanut to hold the line, but in a tragic twist of fate, a rift opened up and spat out the peanut's natural prey turned predator, the Jester. Day 7, and this is like the third time we've seen the Octo Daddy, which is brutal. In fact, this level's sending out far more Octo blokes than Big Wave Beach ever did, but at least we actually get to use the Cub Nut to stop them this time. This level took about an hour in total. I said in my last video that the Octo Daddy isn't as bad as the Wizard because you don't have to face five of them at a time, but now I'm staring down five of these guys, it's got me feeling like the dream of a fisherman's wife. I can probably show that on screen, that's historically significant. Right, I love me some Walnut Bowling, probably more than anyone else, but it's gotta be said. Day 8 might have the best gimmick level in the entire game. Playing Bejeweled but PvZ is already cool enough, but having a skill tree is genius. In fact, these are the only levels in the entire game I went back to multiple times just to see what the upgrade paths were. 10 out of 10 game mode. Day 9 makes us use a swagless version of the Bloomerang. I hate this aubergine looking ass. We have another returning icon in this level with the balloon zombie, and I don't like his redesign that much. The balloon is far too big and the face on it is too neatly drawn. Lucky for us though, he's not geared out of his mind like his well-read cousin. Day 10 is a mix of the Far Future and Frostbite Cave Zombies. They're a very tough bunch, but we do get some power tiles to work with, which are again, tailor-made for the Goober Gang. I haven't mentioned it yet, but this world uses a mix of soundtracks from the first game, and listening to it got me thinking, damn, maybe old people are right, music was just better back then. Day 11 is a rush of pianos, prospectors, and all-star mechs. Weirdly, the piano doesn't make the zombies dance and move lanes. I'm sure it was probably hard to make it interact with zombies from different worlds, but like, why even include it at that point? This level brings us the Shadow Shroom. This guy is absolutely adorable. I'm not fond of the shadow plants in general though, but this guy is easily the best plant from the new world. You know that I think of it, why did they introduce a new gimmick in the shadow plants just for the last world? This could have been a great opportunity to bring back some classics like the Cob Cannon or Doom Shroom. These basement dwellers seem too independent from the modern day. Day 12 has some real heavy hitters. Explosion proof imps, the shovel parasol combo, 
gargantuas, and even dinosaurs, but somehow it's the chicken wrangler that's the biggest nuisance here. The chickens really transcend their tutorial world status for me. They have to be one of the harder zombies for my nuts to deal with. Just when you think you're safe, they appear out of nowhere and rush the house like a pack of chavy youth. This level also limits how many plants can die, but 10 is just kind of a reasonable amount. It's not too hard. Day 13 is another round of Bejeweled, but this time it was hard as shit. I feel like you're on a timer to beat this level before newspaper zombies spawn and you lose on the spot. I did a lot of experimenting and decided that I wanted to upgrade the laser beam. Not for the beam itself, I think it's actually a downgrade from the lightning reed. Instead, I had my eyes set on my beloved electric blueberry. Chat was begging me not to go for the blueberry, insisting that it was bait and that the winter melon was vastly superior, but I stuck to my guns and went for the superior blue ball, and it worked a charm. After an hour of grinding. Day 14 was an exceedingly boring gimmick level. Since it's the final episode, let me give you guys my beloved shaggers a shagrot fact. Did you know that I'm stupendously bad at writing? I'm sure you've noticed that I use the same phrases at nausea, but you probably didn't know that I type even worse than I speak. I wrote all of this series on a big 60 page document with a total word score of 22. Also it's red because there's so many spelling mistakes that my dyslexic ass can't even read with all the blue and red lines everywhere, so I have to make the whole thing red just to obscure all the noise. Day 15 makes us protect two primal walnuts against an inquisition of cannons. The level starts with a single conehead and then four basic zombies all at once. It's not hard to deal with or anything, but it's just the first and last time the game ever does anything like this. It's weird. The imp cannons shoot right on top of the nuts and the prospectors walking backwards are actually a threat to the nuts. The way this world creates conditions for long forgotten zombies to be difficult to deal with is probably my absolute favourite thing about this world. I beat this one by using an infinite barrier to stop the imps and flying zombies, although annoyingly the swinging zombies can still get over it. It took me about an hour to beat. Day 16 was a super fun conveyor belt level where you faced off against a gaggle of gargants. I actually struggled with this level taking me about half an hour to beat since the plants you get are like really random. Sometimes I'd start with only 3 winter melons which are the most important plants here and sometimes I'd get 6 of them. You get a bunch of big hitters to deal with the gargs like citrons and coconut cannons but as soon as you hit the second wave the game mixes it up on you and starts giving you straight garbage like the fat peat and pea shooters. Now that we've dealt with all the gargs, excluding the Dark Ages one for some reason, I can confidently say that the Neon Mixtape Tour Gargan is by far the worst. He was the only reason this level was even hard. Before I attempted this level, I let my girlfriend have a go at it, and I didn't pay much attention and she almost beat it first try. I had to snatch the controls away before she won so I could clear the game first time on stream. Day 17 is another duo level, and this time it's the Turquoise Skull and the Nerd, an odd duo tied by their autistic interests. While I was playing this level, I reminisced of when I was much younger and I was playing this game on my phone with my cousin in the park. The newest world in the game was the far future, and I predicted to my cousin that the final world of the game would be the modern day and you would have to face off against zombies from all the worlds. Kinda neat that I got it right, but it is the most obvious conclusion possible. As for the level itself, unfortunately it's just one of those ones where the explosion that counters everything far too much. Bloom boys are always annoying, but they all appear in the middle lane so a single tournament did the trick. Day 18 pits us against the surfer and the bull. This one's much harder as we get the 1940s London treatment with the amount of balloons trying to kill us. I was about to lose this level when an insanely clutch exploder nut goes off and wipes out most of the molars lanes. In retrospect, instead of spending all my sun on tour nuts, I probably should have invested in a single infinite, but I still did it first try. Day 18 is a tutorial for the most confusing plant in the game, the escape route. Visually, I assumed it was like the Tangle Kelp, but for land, so I used it that way, and to my surprise, it started spawning random bullshit. I only learned that it can swap its position while I was editing this video. You can't drop a mechanic that different to any other plant in the game, at the very end, without saying anything, and expect people to just figure it out. Day 19 is fairly cool, with sun tiles at the front again, but a selection of zombies that can ignore plants with ease. Since we have an influx of sun, I thought I'd bust out my dearest friend the coconut cannon for potentially the last time. I've already touched on the music in this world, but man, that last wave music is perfect. It does a fantastic job of conveying the feeling of the final leg of a journey. Day 21 brings back one of the last throwback zombies, the All Star. He's so iconic to the game that I didn't even realise he was missing. He has a new move where he charges head first at the first target he sees and kills it. When he runs, I think he's the fastest zombie in the game. He breaks the sound barrier, and by that I mean he looks really janky when he runs. Like, I thought my game was lagging, but nah, that's just how he looks. This level wasn't too hard since we can deal with instant kill zombies very easily. There was an extremely close call where a balloon zombie was about to get my ass and I had no sun but a stray exploding that saved me. 
Day 22 is another round of Bejeweled, but requires half the matches of the last one and doesn't spawn newspaper zombies. Please let me know what the design philosophy behind having difficult level spikes in the middle of the game and then far easier levels at the end, because I just, the game does it so much, I don't get it. Day 23 is just Big Wave Beach, including the Snorkel Zombie, which is pretty funny. This level was hard, but I came in clutch with some really clean sequencing and beat it first try. Day 24 introduces us to the last new zombie of the game. The, uh, I think it's supposed to be a football fan. But football fans where I'm from don't really do foam hands, they do racism and domestic abuse. We get power tiles, but arranged in a way where we're never going to get more than two uses from them. The zombie selection here is really weird. We have the piano zombie, who still doesn't work, and we have the bone zombie, which is... <laughs> whatever. The new imp can get kicked by the football zombie, which is really cool. It might be the first time we see two zombies interact like this together, and it's either a reference to garden warfare or vice versa, which makes me really happy. Also, this level gives us six power tiles to use, and one plant food, which is weird. <laughs> Day 25 is really cool. We start off with a full defense that spontaneously combusts, and we have to use the carrot to bring them back. In my mind, this fully redeems the carrot. It's useless on its own and in real gameplay, but the fact it gives us such a unique level is really cool. Also, what the fuck is up with these pool floaty things? I see them all the time in Content Farm Sludge, but why are we only seeing them five levels from the end of the game? It's so bizarre. Day 26 is filled to the brim with big boys. The amount of instant kills in this level made it way too easy to blow everything up with a hardened cherry bomb technique. But I still believe that the beehive mech is the most unfair bullshit in this game. Day 27 is our last round of bewilderment, and this time it requires the same amount of matches as the very first time we played it. Day 28 is a sun production level, and I used the moonflower. I know, I know, it's not a nut, but hear me out. We could easily clear this level the same way we always do, by busting out the sun nut. But this is our first and last time in this challenge to take the Mercadamia nut out for a spin. I have been dying to use this cute ass fella ever since the first episode, and now three levels from the end of the challenge, we finally get to use him. And he's not very good. It's a roided up Endurian, but you know what they say about Polish turds. I don't really get why he's coated in jelly. Putting small nuts in jelly sounds like a prank designed to permanently disfigure someone's teeth, but he does look like a gothic cutie, so I like it. But for a premium plant that costs two exploder nuts, not being able to deal with a cone head is kind of insane. It doesn't help that this level's full of zombies that counter his regeneration, like the all-star, the wizard, and the captain. It took a few attempts to beat it, when we could have cleared this level normally in about 10 minutes. Overall, I'm very disappointed with the Mercadamia, despite how cute he is. But it's almost solace to know that I probably wouldn't have used them anyway if I could. Day 29 is the tomb level. There's a lot of tombs. And the tomb raises here. Which are cool. It's a simple level and a neat gimmick. And it would have been my favourite of this world because it's kind of silly. If it didn't include the loser zombie. Fuck this guy, dude. Day 30 is the last challenge of this game. As for some reason, Day 31 is always piss easy. Here, we have to protect a row of flowers that are very close to the front of the lawn. In total, this level took me about two hours to beat, but I took a very relaxed approach to it. Because one, it's the last challenge of the game and I wasn't in a rush. But also, someone made a video beating this level with nuts only, so I knew it was possible. I quickly caught on that the infinite can cheese this level really hard, but looking back, I really baited myself doing this. As nuts can just play in the first three lanes of the lawn really easily anyway. Day 31, the very last nut upper level of this challenge. We get the stupid bouncy things to deal with again. I used the bowling nuts for this last level because I just love them so much, but they were pretty irrelevant. This level only had two waves and they were both kind of easy. After one last round of Exploder Nut, we close out the game with a fairly uninspired boss rush, which is pretty lame. I was hoping for a rooftop zomboss, but I do like that everyone kind of gets their own final zomboss experience. And with that, I have beaten Plants vs Zombies 2 with only nuts. 11 worlds, 312 levels, 38,000 words, almost 100,000 subscribers, and six months of my life later, our journey ends. And what an adventure it was. I chose nuts almost arbitrarily, only knowing the ones from the first game. And I can't believe we had such a good roster to beat the game with. We had a nut to deal with flyers, a nut to deal with chaff, a nut to deal with instant kills, a nut for sex appeal, and a nut to deal with literally everything the game ever had to offer. I promised that when all was said and done, I'd rank all the worlds in the game. So here they are, least the most favourite. Lost Sea, Jurassic Marsh, Neo Mixtape Tour, Big Wave Beach, Dark Age, Frostblade, Far Future, all three tutorial worlds tied for second, and Modern Day. I loved each and every world this game had. 
but I think modern day was such an incredibly good throwback to all the worlds we've beaten. And I have a special place in my heart for the first three worlds when the game was easier so we can get away without using the busted brothers. Lastly, while the credits play out, I got some closing words. I listed all my goals I've had at university on post-it notes and put them on my wardrobe, ranked by how difficult I think they're going to be. And at the very top of that list was to get 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. It was a feat I never thought I'd be able to achieve, but I knew I'd be lying to myself if I didn't include it as my most wanted goal. I know I say thank you for subscribing in every video, but I could never truly let you guys know how much it means to me. Thank you so much for sticking around and watching my content. I actually bumped into one of my biggest YouTube inspirations the other day, Josh Strife Hayes, and I got to show him my insane YouTube growth. And honestly, I don't think I've ever been more proud of myself in my entire life. I'll be coming back to Plant vs Zombies. I have a video lined up for the first game, but I want to make videos on some other games first. In fact, if you're watching this video within the first week of its release, I'm probably streaming my next challenge over at Twitch. I'm beating Terraria only using the piss book. I'm really hoping you guys check that video out when it drops. And again, thank you all so very much for watching this and making a little goblin's dream come true. Cheers. Oh. Hey, this song come in the mail today? Did someone come in the mail today? No, oh, cause someone came in the mail today. Yeah, I did. 21.